uh, Game Changer event. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, excited to uh, be sharing with you some insights that we're hearing uh, from uh, our, uh, our business. Uh, today, you know, the, the topic really, uh, as the title suggests, digital retailing separating facts from fiction, right? Um, how many of you have heard the term digital retailing, you know, bandied about or read about it, uh, you know, in uh, industry press or someone's pitched you on something called digital retailing, right? So, you know, quite a few, right? Um, you know, the, uh, in my opinion, it's probably one of the most misused and abused terms uh, in our industry. And we're going to drill down into what it means uh, for your store uh, and you know, uh, what uh, you should be doing uh, about it. So again, my name is Andrew Tai. Uh, I'm the CEO uh, at Moto Insight. We're a technology company helping dealers and OEMs redefine automotive retail experiences. I'm excited to be with you uh, because we're going to go through uh, a little bit uh, of an exploration on how the car buying journey uh, is changing, why it should matter to you. We're going to look at best in class examples uh, from retail sectors outside of automotive and talk about how we can learn from those uh, and apply them in your business. Uh, and we'll also take a look at some trends on the horizon uh, that uh, you got to keep an eye on. Uh, and you know, that wave of change uh, that uh, is, is you know, coming uh, in many cases uh, is already upon us. And so, you know, when uh, with the, uh, we, we look at, uh, when we read it, you know, industry press, oftentimes we see headlines like this, right? I've spent the uh, last almost eight years working with dealers and automakers to better understand how to adapt to changing consumer preferences. Now, while many of you have been in this industry longer than I have, you know, even just in the short time that I've been in the business, I've seen a pretty remarkable shift uh, in how consumers uh, have behaving, uh, how dealers uh, are responding to them, uh, and you know, automakers' attitudes as well. And today, one of the most common questions is, you know, are we going to be disrupted? Is this all hyped by the media, or is this something that we actually need to pay attention to uh, and should be worried about? Because whenever there is a lot of change, there's often fear uh, and doubt, because there's often winners and losers. Right? So in it, these once mighty retailers, many of these brands you recognize, uh, were probably once reading those kinds of headlines in their industry publications once upon a time, right? before they were overrun. It's just a cross-section of the many more retailers that have since disappeared or filed for bankruptcy. And you know what? If you ask them, disruption is probably an understatement. But we'll take a look at what really happened here right? and what lessons we can learn from these cautionary tales. Toys R Us is a poster child of what happens when you get comfortable at the top and don't realize that the world has changed uh, around us until it's far too late. So let's drill down into that one, right? It was just May 2017 when Toys R Us admitted that it had fallen behind uh, on e-commerce and announced a bold new plan to revamp their online presence, culminating in a three-year, $100 million investment. Uh, their CEO at the time said that some organizations recognize faster than others that there are shifts in the way customers want to purchase products. And they self-admittedly, it probably took them a little too long to get it, right? These statements foreshadowed all we know wh what happened after, right? Which was their demise and bankruptcy not uh, more than a year after. Because this is what happens when you, know, you fall too far behind. By their own admission, Toys R Us was too slow to recognize that the world had changed around them. And it was too late by the time they did. So their CEO uh, said uh, at the time that you know, uh, the death warrant of the company um, you know, likely was actually signed nearly two decades ago, in the year 2000, when Toys R Us was the king of the toy world. right? and e-commerce was still in its infancy. This, the grainy little screenshot that you see here is actually of Toys R Us's website at the do, turn of the dot-com boom, where Toys R Us dot-com actually just redirected to Amazon's toy section. Right? They had signed a 10-year deal to become Amazon's exclusive partner to sell toys online. Toys R Us effectively gave up its online autonomy to the point that you know, uh, they relied entirely on, on Amazon as their e-commerce solution. And you know, we'll, we'll, we'll drill down into that further in, in terms of parallels that we're seeing in automotive. right? But Toys R Us really didn't bother investing in or developing their own digital capabilities. And while sales in those early years were just fine, 
This was a mistake that would ultimately haunt them. Amazon grew in prominence, size, and scale, as you know, we all know. And eventually, they became a competitor to Toys R Us. Right? And by the time Toys R Us realized that they needed to build out their own online channels, it was far too late. And they were fatally behind the rest of the market. They never recovered. Blockbuster's story shares a lot of the similarities with Toys R Us's demise. Again, with change coming too little and too late. Right? Blockbuster is a story of when hubris of success causes one to bury its, hand in the, bury its head in the sand a little bit. So in 2000, Reed Hastings, the then CEO of uh, a small upstart called Netflix, flew to Dallas to propose a partnership with Blockbuster. Met with their CEO, John Antioco, and his team, and Hastings got laughed out of the room. Right? We all know what happened next. Blockbuster went bankrupt in 2010. Netflix is now a $150 billion company, about 30 times what Blockbuster was worth at its peak. And today, Hastings is wildly hailed as a genius, and Antioco is considered a fool. Hindsight is a little bit of 2020, though, right? So that's the nature of disruption. It creeps up on you and fast. Antioco, the Blockbuster CEO at the time, was actually considered uh, a retail gen genius, a very competent executive, right? That success created blind spots, though. And at the time, Blockbuster had data and research that said people liked going to their stores, that you know, uh, people liked going to their stores because they liked the experience of opening and closing the DVD cases, right? And browsing the shelves and picking up you know, snacks uh, on the way out at the cash register. And even the supposed serendipity of running into their neighbor at the store. So in, in hindsight, again, we can see those uh, uh, you know, uh, excuses as pretty forced excuses to just keep the status quo. Sounds pretty ridiculous, right? But we must remember in our own industry and in our own business, right, to hold up the mirror once in a while, to make sure that we're not missing that creeping change in our own blind spots. We must not let ourselves fall to those same excuses for maintaining the status quo. Retailers in every industry, right, not just automotive, from really groceries to electronics, have been racing to adapt to the rise in e-commerce in order to stay relevant. And yet, notwithstanding all of this upheaval in retail, one interesting fact is that e-commerce still only represents about 10% of total retail sales. Right? Just think about that for a second. It seems that it, that's the nature of disruptive forces. It doesn't take a lot to do a lot of real damage. Cautionary tales of defunct retailers that were too late to evolve seem to finally have reached the automotive industry, though, as many automakers and dealers have too embraced e-commerce and digital retailing. And while technology uh, seems to always be a little bit of a laggard in our industry, that gap compared to other sectors is rapidly closing. Tesla, which was once considered a fringe experiment by our industry, not only for its mission of electrification, but for its unique retail model that allows customers to order online, they're no longer a fringe experiment. Right? Tesla was neck and neck in the fourth quarter with BMW and Mercedes in total sales in the US, even though they had only three models. Right? That kind of customer experience is now quickly becoming more mainstream, as globally, automakers from Jaguar to Hyundai have all deployed some form of online transaction capabilities and are experimenting even further in that direction. Digital retailing in automotive has really moved beyond that early adopter phase now. And you know, we tell the dealer and automaker customers that we work with that if they aren't already putting plans in place to meet this change, they're already falling behind. Now, digital retailing, really big, broad term, though. right? And there are a huge range of examples in the market, some better than others. right? GM's ShopClick Drive was one of the earliest examples of digital retailing, launched in 2013. And at the time, it was a pioneer. But it's also an example of the challenge that automakers and dealers can face if they choose to become software companies themselves and build their own solutions. After five years, one of the most glaring examples is the fact that customers can't save 
and come back later in shop click drive. Right? They acknowledge this right in their FAQ. The ability to save and revisit your digital shopping cart is table stakes in online retail. Just think about you know, your personal experience shopping online in practically every other industry. Amazon, been making moves in automotive retail with their highest profile examples, primarily out of Europe so far, with Fiat, in, uh, Fiat uh, and uh, VW owned brand Seat. So this was one example where you know, it's really just an, uh, uh, more of uh, advanced lead generation and less actual online selling. But this gives a glimpse of what is to come. The caution I would raise about Amazon, though, right, is as a dealer, would you rather your customer transact on an experience that you own and control or on Amazon where they're more Amazon's customer than your own, right? And that's the, 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 the challenge. How do we develop our own capabilities and customer experiences that don't require us to rely uh, on examples like Amazon? So one of the most interesting learnings uh, from this example, though, actually, is Fiat's own customer research showed that while 50% of consumers wanted to buy and pick up, a buy and transact online, nearly all of those customers, 90%, wanted to pick up the vehicle in store. I'm going to repeat that again. 50% of customers said they wanted to buy and transact online. But nearly 90% of those customers wanted to pick up the vehicle in store. right? And you know, that need for both online and in-store experiences is well illustrated in the next example we'll take a look at. So Hyundai Rockar was a new retail concept that was started by Hyundai in the UK in partnership with a local dealer group, actually. Hyundai Rockar store was located in the Blue Water Shopping Mall, which is a large shopping mall just located outside of London. However, aside from its store, Hyundai Rockar actually also offered an entirely online purchase process. Where the magic happens, though, is how the online and in-store experiences work seamlessly together. In fact, 60% of their customers actually leave their store and complete their purchase online. And you know, Hyundai Walker's success really illustrates how delivering better retail experiences can be an offensive move to differentiate as opposed to just a defensive move. Because we often talk to dealers that are wondering, hey, you know, I have to invest in digital to keep up, right? Where we actually think digital retailing and enhancing customer experiences is an opportunity to play offense. Give you an example. The average Hyundai buyer in the UK is male and in his late 50s. Hyundai Rockars customers were 58% women with an average age of 39. And you know, in fact, 94% of Hyundai Rockars, uh, you know, uh, a market share. 94% uh, of Hyundai Rockars uh, buyers uh, were new to the brand, right? So think about that for a second, right? You know, as we get into an increasingly competitive market, right? How do we reach new buyers, new demographics, right? This is an example of how they're doing that successfully. And in the example of the Blue Water Store, Hyundai's market share actually rose from 1.7% to 12% in that local market through a declining overall UK market as a result of that store's presence and differentiated uh, customer experience. This is now being used by Hyundai UK as the foundation to their new click to buy program. Because you know, in actuality, if you compare what most automotive brands and dealers uh, do today with what you see in other industries, it actually makes very little sense. right? And there's so much opportunity left on the table, particularly for those that are progressive and forward thinking, those of you in this room. right? So imagine for a second if you went to Apple's website. right? And you could look at tons of photos and videos and research about iPads and iPhones and iPods and MacBooks. But beyond that, all you could do was fill in your name, your phone number, your email address, your postal code, and wait for someone to call you to make an appointment. That's all you could do. right? Sounds pretty silly. That's the state of nearly every automaker and dealer website today, though. right? Automotive is, in fact, the most lucrative advertising vertical across all retail segments. There is more ad money spent by automakers and dealers than almost anyone else. 
yet how that money is spent is actually the least sophisticated. While it's certainly important to track things like clicks and likes and shares, uh, most automakers and dealerships really do stop at cost per lead, if they even do that, right? Leaving a massive chasm to determining and tracking true ROI, which is ultimately the sale. The interesting insight, though, is if you look at many of the social media platforms where ad spend, including you know, many of you in the room, have migrated money to, right? These platforms that were all about those likes and shares and visits and clicks, right? They're now all focused on generating the sale. This just illustrates how even the leading platforms now realize that audience alone isn't enough. Successful marketing must turn audience into actual buyers. And the best way to do that is to make it easy and seamless, eliminating as much friction as possible on that path to purchase. Right? Going from that's a nice top to that's the right color to in my shopping cart and bought in just a few clicks. Right? Or from those are cool shoes to that's my size to it'll be here tomorrow in just a few swipes. And you know, listen, I, I recognize that buying a car invariably has more steps. Right? My point here, though, is that just driving clicks and visits and impressions and even leads isn't enough anymore. Right? Enabling digital retailing that allows the customer to go far further in that purchase journey, which in turn will enable you with more precise data on who is actually buying, which in turn will enable you with more precise data to target your ad spend, which in turn will generate more likely buyers. That's really the opportunity. So digital retailing, really big loaded term, right? We talked about how we're gonna separate the facts from fiction. And you know, there's really a lot of debate for dealers on what it means. So our perspective, is that there are no one-size-fits-all definitions. However, different dealers will have different approaches. But here are a few guiding principles that we believe in. Customers, one, want to do far more than just fill in a lead on your website. And solutions that just reshuffle the deck to generate a few more leads is not a differentiated approach. Rather, enabling better customer experiences with greater transparency and convenience really is the key. Digital retailing must be far more than e-commerce, right? At Moto Insight, we believe that the right customer experience is about far more than simply putting a buy it now button on your website. Digital retailing is about how to serve customers better, and the in-store components of that are just as important as the online components. And digital retailing, involves far more than just your website, no matter how great it is. One interesting stat is that uh, Ernst & Young's Future of Automotive Retail Study said that only 52% of buyers actually visited the dealer's website during the purchase process. Now, some of you might be glass half full kind of people, right? But my point is, is that if all you focus on is your website, you're forgetting about the potentially half of customers that never even touch it. So the data is overwhelmingly clear that we need to make investments here. 86% of car buyers would choose a dealer that enabled online buying over another that didn't. Even if that customer ultimately doesn't buy the car entirely online. Having that choice differentiates your brand and your dealership. The vast majority of car buyers, 71%, according to Capgemini, still want to take a test drive before buying. So physical interaction still plays a critical role in that buying journey. And so that brings me to my first takeaway. We're going to have five today. Your physical dealership is actually critical in digital retailing. People still want a touch and feel experience. Buyer behavior is rapidly shifting, and there's no doubt that more of the car buying journey has and is moving online. And according to Bain Research, 60% of car buyers already decide on the brand, the model, and the price they want to pay, even before visiting your dealership. This has led to a compression in the amount of time and number of visits that customers make to physical dealerships. Depending on which report you read, it's somewhere between you know, one and two visits today. Right? It used to be over five. And so dealerships must adapt to this new reality. 
the battleground has effectively shifted online for customers. And if you don't engage them early in that shopping process in a differentiated way, before they step foot into your store, they may actually never end up in your store. So there's no denying that customers want to do more online. Another report that we like to cite, 54% of customers want to put the entire deal online together and then finalize the paperwork at the dealership. The days of hammering out a deal in the showroom for hours over a weekend between the sales manager's office, the business manager's office, and back and forth, that's starting to fade away. And you know, the proportion of customers that want to buy their car entirely online is growing too, with reports that say as many as a third would do so if they could. So an effective customer experience is one that enables customers really to shop whenever, wherever, and however they want. If Amazon's moves are any indication, actually, the importance of physical stores are going to remain for the foreseeable future. It's kind of ironic, actually, if you think about it. right? For all the doom and gloom that Amazon is casting over the retail world and physical retailers, that Amazon itself is now building its own physical stores. Right? They bought Whole Foods because of that physical store footprint. However, Amazon's success lies in how their online and in-store channels work seamlessly together. And to that point, it's omni-channel experiences that transcend online and in-store barriers that will win. So here are some examples that many of you will probably recognize of how consumers have already shifted to omni-channel experiences. It's already occurred and delivering success in other industries. Many of you drink Starbucks, right? But few of you probably realize that about a third of their order volume now involves the Starbucks app, with many customers ordering and paying without having to line up or talk to anyone. They simply tap, tap, walk into the store, and leave. Just a few years ago, right? Just a few years ago, no one would have thought something as simple and physical as buying a cup of coffee would be transformed by technology. Omni-channel experiences have spread, practically, spread to practically all retail sectors, from Walmart to Nordstrom's. The interesting thing is retailers have blurred the lines between their digital and physical storefronts with experiences like buy online and pick up in store. This seamless combination of online and in-store experiences from consumers is really now the gold standard. right? And at the end of the day, convenience is craved by every demographic. Even Warby Parker, right? Many of you may have heard of Warby Parker before. They're the disruptive eyeglass manufacturer and retailer that was first born online as an e-commerce only brand. But they've since moved to Omnichannel, building their own network of stores to enable that touch and feel experience with something that is quite personal, right? A pair of eyeglasses. As their founder, Neil Blumenthal, explained, the future of retail is really at the intersection of e-commerce and bricks and mortar. And with Warby Parker, their in-store experiences drive customers that ultimately buy online. And their online experiences ultimately drive customers that visit their stores. This isn't a prediction so much as it's already happening and succeeding. The big question is, how do we replicate that in our industry and in our dealerships? So bottom line, pace of change is accelerating. And those that stay static have the risk of being left behind. And automotive is not immune. A poster child of that revolution that is really already upon us is Carvana, the inventors of the car vending machine. Right? Five years ago, this company didn't exist. Today, they're a $9.5 billion market cap public company that sold 100,000 units in 2018 and is on track to double again this year. Just trying to imagine what our industry will look like in another five years, right? pretty crazy. Automakers and dealerships that choose to embrace this change, though, really have a tremendous opportunity to differentiate. And what these and uh, the other examples illustrate is that the traditional retail model of just starting and finishing online is no longer enough. The uh, retail model of starting and finishing only in store is not enough either. 
And so omnichannel is really that blend between in-store and online experiences where both can interact seamlessly. So think about this in the automotive context, right? Imagine this experience. If you could create a digital shopping cart online with the vehicle you were interested in, complete a credit app, get a trade-in appraisal done virtually, all before you step foot into the dealership, and when you walk into the store, pick up seamlessly exactly right where you left off, right? Or perhaps the inverse of that, you walk into a store, take a test drive, instead of just being handed a business card and a brochure as you leave the store, you're set up with a digital shopping cart with exactly everything that had been discussed, and when you get home, you can show the wife, you decide on it, you can finish the transaction right from home, right? That's really the success that we're seeing in other retail sectors, but what a beautiful retail experience in automotive could look like. Because in reality, buying a car is never really quite a straight line, with most customers moving between online and offline channels on an average of four times before they end up purchasing their vehicle. And you know, when you throw in the differences between tier one, tier two, and tier three experiences, it's no wonder why buying a car can be one of the most confusing and frustrating retail experiences that consumers experience today. In a research report entitled The Future of Auto Retailing, Deloitte underscored the importance of understanding and adapting the way we serve customers with this. When it comes to making car purchase decisions, Generation Y drivers, which is the fastest growing segment, value customer experience three times as much as vehicle design. Now, personally, I think that might be a little bit of an exaggeration. I'm a bit of a car guy, so I really care about vehicle design. But it just underscores how customer experience is the new frontier where dealerships uh, are winning and losing. So this is an example of the customer experience of the future that we believe will soon become mainstream in automotive retail. Genesis, the luxury brand that spun out of the Hyundai family, has taken the car buying experience to a whole new level by enabling consumers to complete the entire vehicle purchase process online if they want to, but also seamlessly in store or the combination of the two. And this was a global first, actually. Even Tesla's purchase experience doesn't quite go as far. So Genesis' goal was to remove as much administrative friction as possible so that customers could spend their time focused on product and not the process. And we're proud to enable this experience with our technology, which was first launched in early 2017 in the Canadian market and is now actually being extended to other international markets with Genesis Australia launching the same experience later this year. So let's go through that together. The photo that you see here is actually of Genesis Mississauga, a dealership which is located in the Square One shopping mall. Right? Genesis Mississauga bought into that omni-channel philosophy that the in-store experience was just as important as the online experience. In the Genesis at home experience, as they like to call it, customers have the ability to seamlessly transition between online and in-store as they please. Anything done online can be seamlessly picked up from the store. Anything done on the showroom floor could be seamlessly continued from home. Here's how the Genesis at home experience works. Consumers can custom configure the vehicle they want with a dynamic build and price, choosing colors or options, or select their de desired vehicle. Recommended accessories, warranties, and other F&I products can also be added to their digital shopping cart through a dynamic Q&A recommendation engine that helps customers choose the right products based on their needs. At every point, customers can see a dynamic, penny-accurate pricing and payment that can be customized whether they are buying in cash, lease, or finance. And adding and saving the car and products to your shopping cart is actually just the first step in Genesis at home. Customers can get a virtual trade-in appraisal online, reserve your vehicle with a credit card deposit, get credit approved online, and even book an in-person appointment and more. Do you have a question? Can they negotiate? So in the Genesis example, they are actually a one price model, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, so that's actually a one price model. And you know, we are seeing more and more dealerships move towards that. That said, right, digital retailing does not exclusively mean, hey, you have to do one price, right? And I'd be happy to talk about how we're seeing dealers implement uh, a digital retailing uh, in that more traditional model uh, of pricing uh, and doing it successfully. 
So let's keep going through the experience. The trade-in process starts with an instant estimate from Canadian Black Book on basic vehicle information from the customer. This is not necessarily anything new, right? Many of your dealer websites uh, have this. But where it goes far deeper is a detailed questionnaire is then presented in order to receive a virtual appraisal from that selected dealer. Vehicle photos are captured from the customer with a mobile-friendly technology that doesn't actually require any app download or installation and simply sends uh, a dynamic link via text message to the customer's smartphone triggering their camera. And all this information is presented to the dealer for evaluation and response. And because the dealer is giving a virtual appraisal, obviously it's subject to physical inspection right, to ensure accurate disclosures. But once that appraisal is submitted, customers are able to see updated pricing inside their shopping cart with the trade-in applied, almost like a coupon code. Right? And this is particularly useful in helping customers understand the impact of tax saving from their trade-in right, to get a more accurate view uh, on affordability. This customer journey is the same. Whether the customer starts it from home, at their computer, or with a salesperson on a tablet on the showroom floor. And if you started from home, you could effectually, effectively virtually wheel your digital shopping cart into the store and complete the transaction alongside a salesperson without skipping a beat. Alternatively, let's say if your journey started in store with a test drive, perhaps you, know, uh, you, know, you had, hadn't done really anything online just yet. Right? Your, your salesperson can actually save all of the items discussed and the deal that was built out on a tablet into a digital shopping cart that you could receive an invite link to and complete from home at any point in time. Customers can reserve and order their vehicle with a credit card deposit, get a credit approved online with a paperless application that eliminates the need for emailed PDFs and scanned forms, uh, or if some dealers still use it, fax documents. This even means no more duplicate entry of the credit app at the dealership. And Genesis at Home can even manage the vehicle delivery process, allowing customers to book appointments online in an open table style calendar. And even pre-delivery document capture is handled digitally inside Genesis at Home for everything from a copy of their driver's license through to their auto insurance information. And while online and in-store experiences are equally important, Genesis's deployment underscores that it is possible to enable a fully end-to-end -end digital transaction that covers the final mile to delivery, including document generation and execution. And in Genesis's case, as you see here, the vehicle can actually be delivered to the customer. And you know what? When you think about the customer experiences, right, that delight, it would be hard for any customer not to get excited by this kind of experience, right? So you might say, that's pretty cool, right? Love the delivery with the truck and everything, but why should I care and how can this benefit me as a dealer? Meaning the bottom line, right? I could spend an hour on this part alone, but here's the punchline. The data is clear, right? Seamless customer journeys that save customers time dramatically increase CSI, which ultimately lead to customer loyalty and your profitability. And in particular, connecting in-store experiences with technology like tablets can help significantly differentiate your dealership. So a couple of stats. According to JD Power, customer satisfaction has a proven and direct correlation with the number of hours a buyer has to spend in the dealership to get a deal done. The longer the time spent in the dealership, the lower the satisfaction. Any successful digital retailing experience at its core is designed to save customers time and enable them to complete far more of the purchase journey at their leisure. As well, according to another JD Power study, openness and perceived transparency of purchase, openness and transparency of the purchase process are often factors that have a disproportionate effect on overall customer satisfaction. And this is precisely where tablet-enabled experiences can be highly effective. So ratings for salesperson honesty and fairness of price paid, two primary factors in overall customer satisfaction, meaningfully improve when a salesperson uses a tablet as part of the sales process for things like reviewing pricing or payment, demonstrating vehicle features, capturing order data. Incidentally, many of the things that we just saw earlier being done in the digital retailing example we went through. 
And yet, just 10% of customers today actually encounter this type of best-in-class experience, even though the cost to deploy such customer experiences really are at all-time lows with readily available consumer technology like simple iPads or Android tablets replacing expensive proprietary hardware that was once necessary in order to bring this kind of stuff to life. And fully responsive web experiences like those that we saw earlier have replaced you know, expensive standalone apps that require downloading and installation. So it doesn't take a lot of imagination to draw the line between higher CSI and ultimately dealer performance. Right? According to Merit's, increasing satisfaction by one box on a five-point scale leads to an average of two and a half million in incremental loyalty-related revenue. And on the point about loyalty, one of the most effective cases for digital retailing is actually about retaining your existing customers, delivering what we like to call a key-to-key -key experience. Because if you think about it, your existing customers are actually the lowest hanging fruit when it comes to digital retailing. They already know your brand, and they're driving one of your vehicles. If their lease is coming due, let's say, right, your odds of retaining them are far higher if you can deliver a seamless, frictionless experience that dynamically shows recommended options for their next vehicle based on historical data, enables them to complete a lease self-inspection before they even come into the dealership using the same virtual trade-in technology that I showed you earlier, and effectively finalize a deal before even walking into the store so that when they do come in, they can simply hand you their old set of keys and pick up the new ones. To borrow an inspiration from Amazon, it's kind of like the one-click purchase, but for cars. And I get that you know one click might be a little too simple, but you understand the philosophy. So we actually just launched this for Audi Financial Services uh, in the US, and it's a far cry from the generic, static, you know, physical pieces of uh, mail or even email campaigns that most dealers and automakers send today to customers when they come to an end of term that simply ask them to come in and make an appointment. So the parallels that we've looked at from other industries, I believe, really telegraphs much of the change that's about to happen in our industry. Right? And the traditional car buying transaction is experiencing significant disruption. And in the not so distant future, the nature of ownership will change as well. This is a trend to keep your eye on on the horizon. A growing segment of customers may not want to own a car. They may just want to drive one. And although ownership isn't entirely going away, the model of the future might need to be more flexible, simplified, and no surprise, customer-centric. So take the disruption that has happened in music as an example. Right? In the 90s, you would walk into an HMV and buy an album, like an actual CD. Right? In the 2000s, that transaction moved online. You could buy it on Amazon and have it shipped to you. Right? Or you paid 20 bucks and you actually downloaded an album onto you know, your iPod. Today, the nature of that transaction has entirely changed. Right? We don't buy albums anymore. We just buy music. You don't need to own the album, per se. You just want to listen to the music. Google Music, Spotify, you know, other music subscription services have now given you that, unlimited, for a fixed monthly price. And we believe automotive will go through a similar evolution. So today, the status quo is that traditional car buying experience of visiting different dealerships. That transaction is quickly moving online. Right? And we showed examples of how that's already happening. But in the not too distant future, the nature of that transaction may evolve as well, where a growing segment of customers may not even want to own the car. They'll just want to drive it. Now, I want to be clear, I'm not saying that ownership is dead or entirely dying. Right? I don't believe that that's the case. And in fact, I think a lot of the media hype uh, you know, around fully autonomous pods that carry us around, like you know, in the Tom Cruise movie Minority Report, right, is many, many decades away, if not more. Between Minority Report, though, and where we are today in traditional ownership, I think there's a spectrum. There have been attempts at this before right, with businesses like CarShare. However, you know, even though Zipcar and Car2Go, brands you may have heard of, have been around for more than a decade, 
there are reasons why they haven't achieved the mass market success that they had originally hoped. They really only work best in highly urban areas and for those that may not be able to afford a car on their own. The likely model of the future is probably something in between, a hybrid that I'll call flexible ownership. Some people call it subscription. Imagine when a customer walks into your dealership in the near future, the options for them to drive away and off the lot could go beyond cash, finance, or just lease. Like movies on your Netflix subscription, it's as good as yours, right? No need to rush to return it by the deadline, no worrying about booking reservations like car share. However, bring it back whenever you want or whether your circumstances have changed and you need to cancel your subscription or you just want to upgrade to something new. Pay one monthly price and don't worry about anything else like maintenance or insurance and forget about the worry of commitment, right? No more hassles of trade-ins. That could be a thing of the past. It's like you have a whole garage full of cars at your disposal without any of the worries of ownership. Jeff Weiler Automotive Group in the US is a leader in this space, and Kevin Fry, their e-commerce director, has a saying that I love. It's self-disruption combined with strong leadership is the answer to our future. You know, the future might be closer than it actually seems. There are many brands that have already started experimenting with this, albeit no real mass market examples of it just yet. Porsche is one of those growing numbers of brands that have already tried subscription models in the market. For a fixed monthly price, customers can subscribe to a Porsche Passport, which enables them access to a variety of Porsche models. There are multiple tiers of membership depending on the models that you want, right? BMW, Lexus, Mercedes, a bunch of others have also started experimenting with this. I think one of the key things to pay attention to, though, is that 78% of their buyers that are going through this new model are new to the brand. And this just goes back to even the earlier Hyundai example that we talked about. Trying to deliver differentiated customer experiences is as much about playing offense and expanding your potential market as it is about playing defense. And right here at home in Canada, we're actually proud to be enabling Care by Volvo with our technology, which was the first ever vehicle subscription service in Canada launched last year. And for a fixed monthly price that includes everything from maintenance to winter tires and a full range of protection coverages, customers can subscribe to a new Volvo S60 or V60 in under a minute. Almost like a cell phone, right? Where customers have the ability to upgrade to a new model every 12 months. And while it's still early days for flexible ownership models. The reason why this should be on your radar and you should keep an eye on it on the horizon is that it can materially change the economics of the dealer business, but it also delivers new opportunities. Potentially increasing profit with new, uh, new revenue from bundled product like insurance, capturing 100% of service revenue with bundled maintenance, increasing loyalty as vehicle switching costs within the dealership inventory occur, and potentially increasing the customer base as the threshold for ownership becomes much lower. And so this is all well and good, right? We spend a lot of time exploring you know, the future state, what can be, what can be in the future. The reality is that subscriptions or even online sales is not something that will dramatically change your business tomorrow or next month or likely even next year. Disruption doesn't happen overnight. They are important to understand and start adapting to early in order to future-proof your business. However, let's bring this all back home by zeroing in on how you can apply digital retailing technology, like the experience I showed in the Genesis example, to make a tangible business in your different, in your tangible difference in your business now. The golden principle that I like to follow is simply take your dealer hat off for a moment and just think like a consumer because you are all consumers, right? Ask yourself, what experience would you want? Consumers today, after spending 10 plus hours online researching the vehicle they want, are almost always driven to fill in a lead with name, email, address, phone number, right? To wait for someone to call so that you can take the next step in that purchase process. Think of yourself. When was the last time you, as a consumer, right, found a product you liked online that you wanted to buy, 
and went and filled in your name, your email address, your phone number, and waited for someone to call you. Probably been a while. Maybe never, right? Like you, consumers don't want to do this, and by and large, largely avoid it wherever they can. Imagine if you found a product that you wanted on Amazon, and when you clicked Add to Cart, it just asked you to fill in a lead. Seems kind of silly, right? At Moto Insight, we do a fair amount of mystery shopping on dealerships. And this is why people hate filling in lead forms. You end up getting hammered with emails and phone calls. right? I get 10 emails from simply submitting one lead form, where I ask someone for an estimated lease payment on a vehicle that I was interested in. Worse yet, the responses that I get add very little value and didn't answer my questions about payments and just push me to book an appointment or give them a call. Right? Unfortunately, this is actually pretty status quo in our industry. So my advice is let's just stop talking about online selling for a moment. Right? And let's focus on how you get your dealership can apply digital retailing technology to change that behavior we just talked about before we focus on online selling. Herein lies the potentially biggest opportunity right in front of most dealerships, where we can move the needle in your business in the short term. More than 95% of visitors to your website do not fill in a lead, because as we discussed, it's kind of a silly experience, right? even in this day and age. Though many of those customers are very interested in buying a car. Enabling customers to do more and go further online beyond, purchase, beyond just filling in the lead, enabling them to do more of the purchase steps is really the opportunity to differentiate. And even more so, less than 10% of customers that take their time to fill in a lead form actually turn into a sale. If you're a dealer, I want you to think this through with me. Right? Use your own numbers. Let's say you get 500 online leads a month across all of your channels, right? Trader, Kijiji, Car Gurus, your own website, Tier 1 website, whatnot. And you convert 10% to sales. What happened to the other 90%? If we could engage those leads better and convert them at 11 or 12 or 15 or 20, that translates into real impact in your sales. I want you to imagine what if your dealership stopped responding to leads with the same status quo response that every other dealership in your market is likely giving, where the message is simply, come on into the store or give me a call. And what if instead your dealership lead response sounded something more like this? Thanks for checking out that vehicle listed on our website. I've added the exact car you wanted into a digital shopping cart that you can continue with below. You'll be able to customize payments, get virtual trade in appraisal, do all of these things at your leisure. I'm here if you want to talk to me or have any questions. Right? As a consumer, which response would you rather engage with? The status quo that just asks you to come on into the store or give me a call, or the differentiated response? And it's no surprise that our data and experience shows that differentiated response wins hands down every time. And it's now easier than ever for your dealership to deliver this kind of experience with digital retailing technology. So in closing, going back to that original question we started with, right? are dealerships going to be disrupted? Yes. Disruption is coming. It doesn't come overnight, though. But that's where the changes that we need to make don't come overnight either. To borrow a line from Charles Dickens, it's the best of times and it's the worst of times to be a car dealer. It's an amazing time to be in this industry if you're on the offense. But it's potentially the worst time to be in this industry if you're only focused on playing defense. And I think many dealers are too focused on playing defense. But that's where your opportunity lies and why you're here today. So here are a few things to keep in mind as you think about planning your offense. Right? Digital retailing is about far more than selling online. And online and store experiences must operate seamlessly. They're both equally important. And digital retailing technology that's successful is really focused on being able to do that more than just selling online. Tablet-enabled opportunities is actually a really big missed opportunity for many dealerships. Very few 
are taking advantage of that. Ownership may potentially evolve towards greater flexibility, something to keep your eye on on the horizon. But ultimately, bring it back to think like a consumer. What would you want? What's the experience you want? Which lead would you rather engage with? There's going to be lots of debate and no one-size-fits-all solutions, but the key insight that we draw here from the words of Deloitte, retailers are now seeing customers compare their buying experiences across industries, and the old adage, that's how it's always been done, is increasingly inadequate. And so with that, I really appreciate uh, your time. Uh, happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have, uh, and hopefully digital retailing uh, means a heck of a lot more uh, to you now than it did uh, at the beginning of the session. Thanks very much, guys. So someone's got to have some questions. This has been an amazing session. So go ahead, please. Yeah, so the, 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 uh, one of the pieces of technology that we enable dealers with, I like to characterize this, is enabling dealers with the technology to deliver Tesla rivaling Amazon-like experiences. That Genesis experience that you just showed, right? we, we can enable any dealership uh, to deliver that experience under their brand. Anyone else? What about pre-owned? Same for pre-owned. Yeah, you know, what, what's interesting actually, we actually find that pre-owned uh, you know, when it comes to customers going deep into the transaction journey, uh, pre-owned is actually getting more uptake. So, for example, uh, the act of reserving your vehicle with a credit card uh, deposit, right, before you step foot into the store, we actually see a higher propensity of customers doing that on used than they do on new. And that's the dynamic where with pre-owned, you know, it uh, could be a diamond in the rough, right, where if I find that car, I want to secure it um, before I, it can get sold uh, away from me. Uh, and we actually see customers uh, engaging with that uh, more than they do on the new side. But the opportunity uh, is really on both sides of the business. Do you think that's going to be about uh, some of the more younger vendors? I think it's also a good time to put out as much content as possible because uh, more faster content is easier to pick up. I don't think so necessarily. I mean, there's always a benefit to scale, right? Um, and you know, uh, uh, being undersized is always a, a challenge. That said, uh, you know, with digital retailing technology, uh, enabling customers really to transact before you even step foot into the store, right? Um, one of the, the uh, trends that's on the horizon is enabling uh, dealers uh, to rethink what kind of infrastructure and storefront they actually need, right? Um, and that's where, you know, you look at uh, a Genesis Mississauga, where they haven't built, you know, a massive storefront, right? Um, and they're selling cars just differently. I think you know if you're thinking about a used car store or a smaller used car store, you know it's an opportunity for them to do business differently and potentially do business with a different uh, kind of infrastructure. So I don't think it necessarily boxes out independence. Um, you know, uh, it's it's just uh, going to come down to who can differentiate their customer experience. Yep. Do you have any statistics on the, the Genesis program or platform as to how many customers want to know and pay full cost of the car and don't want retail for retail? Yeah, so with, with, with Genesis, because it is a fixed price model, right, you know, uh, they, 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 there, it, there, there is no discounting on it. But in, in dealerships that we work with uh, that are more traditional in terms of their pricing structure, it doesn't change the fact that customers want to go far further uh, into the purchase journal, ch channel, and they ultimately still come on into the store, right? But you go back to that lead uh, response example, right? Today, uh, if a customer asks for, let's say, payments uh, in response to a lead that they submit off of a piece of inventory uh, on uh, Auto Trader, right? If you can engage that customer by giving at least an indicative payment, enabling them to take the next step on tr on at least an initial trade-in, enable them to take the next step on at least at least submitting a credit application, that guided journey before they step foot into the store, right? Um, when they come into the store, may they still negotiate? Yeah, likely, potentially, right? Uh, you know, if that's the the way uh, you do business. But engaging that customer further, you you you've kind of bridged that gap between that first click to them coming into the store, and when they come into the store, if you can pick up where they left off and help them work and build that deal from where they left off, that's where you've differentiated the dealer experience. This is less about selling online, as I said. It's just more about bridging that gap between online and offline. And as simple as something like you know, how do we increase engagement and conversion of the customers that are already at our doorstep? So let's say you fully buy into this idea of something you guys are. Yeah. Um, and I say to myself, you know what, okay, it's like, I want this fast paced, great technology to have online. Do you tell
That's a great question. So even if you said you wanted to go all in tomorrow, yeah. we would not recommend it, right? We really think that, yes, it is a big change to go from a traditional store model to you know, this kind of uh, new buying model. And as I said earlier, it's still a very small minority of customers that want to buy entirely online, right? Really, the, our, our uh, recommendation uh, is look for the smallest increment of change that you can make and just start building momentum, right? Um, ultimately, you know, yeah, I think we all, uh, most dealers, I rarely get come across a dealer that says, hey, that future state we're that we're talking about, I fundamentally disagree with it. There may be a point around, you know, hey, how long that takes from a timing standpoint, right? But um, you know, incremental change uh, is really the, the path to success. So you know, if we look at your leads and you're responding to leads like everybody else, let's start there, right? Step one, okay? And then how can we bridge the online to in-store in -store experience? Step two, right? Before you go all in and think about you know, transforming everything. We try to... So uh, I think vi most dealers that we've come across and that we work with, right, uh, when you try to bite off too much, it's setting it up for, for failure. Genesis was unique where we got to build from the ground up. Now, I don't know enough about your store, right? You, 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 may, you, you may believe and, and you may be right that, hey, you know, you've got the right team, the right, you know, uh, wherewithal, the right willpower to go all in. And I think that will put you even further ahead uh, of the rest of the market. So, yeah, there's an opportunity there. But by and large, when we look at dealerships across the industry, right, incremental change really is the way uh, to, to go about it, right? Um, and it's just about building momentum uh, towards success as opposed to biting uh, too much uh, off in, uh, in one bit. Sure. Or now they say I'm a, you know, I went to on haggle. They they kind of adapted themselves automatically. The, mm -hmm. evolu the, the evolution of the program they adapted themselves. Yeah. Where now they're happy to do your yeah. store on a haggle member. So yeah. That way it may push them up to the store easier slowly. Because, yeah. Because you know they've been paying a little bit off. On haggle sets them up to yeah. you know three percent markup or whatever. Yeah. They can get them, and uh, I think that automatically the sales people are just gonna uh, evolve with them. Right? Yeah, for sure. And, and I'll actually I'll, I'll add one one last comment there on how do you you know uh, enable you, that change for your salespeople. So um, one of the guys on our team uh, that leads our dealer success uh, organization, he actually came from Tesla and helped build out the Tesla retail network, right? And what was funny, he tells the story often about how when he started building out uh, Tesla stores and hiring people to to staff these Tesla stores, they were severely under budget, and so they they didn't have you know the ability to hire high paid car salespeople. They had to hire, you know, baristas, right, or people that were just working in other stores inside of the mall, right? You know, hourly paid employees uh, to sell these hundred thousand dollar, you know, uh, Tesla Model S's at the beginning. And really, the way they overcame that was using technology to drive process, right? Um, and so, you know, having the right technology that guides not just the customer through the transaction, but your salespeople through the transaction, right? So it's a consistent journey every single time. That's what will make that change easier. But it, it, we always recommend to do it in increments um, uh, uh, in order to build momentum towards that ultimate goal. Happy to talk about that more afterwards. So I think we're, we're up on time. Is that right, Jason? Yep. Yep, okay, all right. Great, thanks Perfect. very much, guys. Thank you. So without further ado, I'll pass out the full handouts. <laughs> Dwayne Marino, everybody. Everybody's okay? Yes? Yes. Okay. Let's uh, get this going. All right. What I've got is a sheet of paper there, which I'd like to start on the back of it, actually. So being a trainer, I tend to uh, keep it interactive and, and kind of go that way. So I call this the six Ps. I want to start with this real quick. We've got about 45 or 50 minutes for a talk. Let's write down the first word. And the first word is principles. Uh, there's three principles of selling I don't see going away anytime soon. I think his talk was excellent on where the market's moving right now. And there's always a gap between where you are and the, where the market is. So when I first started, the gap was leasing. So leasing was taking off, dealers didn't know how to do it. So I moved into the gap with training. Then the next big gap was lease renewals, because then the cycle was coming off, nobody knew how to renew. So I moved into that gap. That 
created a big gap, which nobody could organize their data. So you may not know this, but I invented CRM for car dealers. So back in 1995, I contracted out to a software uh, partner of mine in British Columbia, and we created the first CRM piece in automotive. And some dealers are still using it. So the gap there was organization of that window. Next big gap for me was skills. And this gap right now is this experience between online and live. And it's a real interesting dynamic how some people start in the showroom. We'll talk about who finishes online and who doesn't. Some people start online and finish in the showroom. But with principles, there's three points to write down if you could. And there's three things that I don't see going away anytime soon. One is lead generation. So whoever your dealership for sales people are lead genning, uh, if the website, website's driving that, if you're still trying to call, that's going to be a problem. Um, how many of you have uh, no landline in your life at home? No landline, only a cell phone, show me. I asked this question in the last 12 months in Honolulu, in Halifax, in Shreveport, Louisiana, in Tampa, Florida, in uh, Seattle, in California, in Vancouver, right across Canada, and my guess is 85% of people don't have a landline. So we're tell still telling our salespeople to call your customers, call your customers. No landline. On your phones, do you have something called caller ID or call display? How many of you absolutely do not pick up the phone hardly at all anymore unless you want to, you know who it is, and you feel like it's something you want to do? When a salesperson calls you in line at McDonald's or when you're wiping your kid's ass, <laughs> what's your reaction to that salesperson? Yeah, because we're caught off guard because these things are with us personally all the time. So phoning right now is, I'm going to say, pretty ineffective. How many of you have more than one email address, personal or professional, more than one email? How many of you pick and choose who's going to get what email? How many of you absolutely do not open up, answer all your emails? Even with a primer email that goes to your phone, do you actually delete things out of your inbox without opening them, yes or no? Who here has a hard time listening to voicemail? Who does not listen to voicemail? Who has voice to text? If voice to text isn't working, you say, well, too bad for you. If you can't articulate well enough, I guess I'm not going to talk to you. Who has that attitude? Yes or no? So to me, it's all about psychology. Now, how many times a day are you checking your text messages? How many times a day do you think we're checking our texts? Why do we check our texts like an addiction? It's short. We probably have a relationship already. Somebody's texting. And I'm going to tell you, I still have not clients, but dealerships that I meet, that their managers say, stop texting people and pick up the phone and call them. Could you not send somebody a text that says, please call me? Are you more likely to get a call back on a text that says, please call me? Yes or no? Yeah. There's still dealerships that block um, uh, the server, so salespeople can't log into social media in the showroom. They've got like a Faraday cage around the showroom. Who's seen this? There's a huge gap between what you're talking about and where the business is. It's not even funny. And um, lead generation is something you've got to address. Test drives are still going to happen some way, somehow. Uh, who's ever gone to a phone store and VR'd a car or done VR on a phone? Have you seen the technology of VR with a phone, yes or no? It's pretty good technology on a phone. So this is going to come to mainstream on websites. Uh, Cadillac, I know, just launched this. Somebody sent me an article through LinkedIn. It was called The Demise of the Death of the Car Salesman, or Car Sales Lady, whatever it was. And it was because you could do a virtual walk around with a, with a live assistant on a car. I think Hyundai might have it, too. Has anybody seen this? Okay, so what's happening with this is more and more of the decision making, the selection is happening, but people still, because it's a physical product and we're not living in, well, maybe we are in a VR if you follow that, but we're not living in uh, driving a VR car yet, they still seem to want to physically drive a car. Is that fair? Very few people, local buyers, feel confident enough in the pricing procedure to finalize price online, especially if there's a trade. So today in uh, you know, dealerships processes, the gap is how are we doing with lead generation, pricing, and test drives? Because yeah, the online thing is there, but it's not taking away our job as a dealer. Let's write down the next P. Next P is practices. OK, practices. Um, BlackBerry, anybody kind of remember that company? <laughs> they started the smartphone industry. They had 100% market share. You watch Noel Jerry Seinfeld. Everybody's going, where's my BlackBerry? Where's my they had it locked. Nobody else had that technology. And then they did not kind of get it through their heads that everybody didn't need a keyboard and the importance of apps. And now you say BlackBerry and you heard what happened. People laugh. They laugh. Okay, so the phrase here, if you want to write it down, remember it, it's called adapt or die or evolve or dissolve. But you got to keep it realistic to where the market is. When we drive our car, you can't stare at the speedometer. You can't stare at the car behind you or in front of you. You can't stare too down. There's a sweet spot of where you're going to look when you're driving to know your surroundings and drive into that gap but there's a sweet spot in that visual, and I think business is a lot like that. Okay, so we have uh, principles, we have practices. Next P to write down, please, is psychology. It does start with a P. Okay, P-S-Y. 
Um, this is my sort of claim to fame. I'm formally trained in a lot of psychology. I take a course from a few key people all the time. Um, I follow people online that are into it. So my thing is really about this. And uh, psychology really is the study of reactions. It's how to create a reaction. It's how to manage a reaction. And you can't take the psychology piece yet uh, all the way into technology because people are still involved. So psychology, your own psychology, your people's psychology, how they're trained, what they know is still a big piece as well as how your customers are reacting. And we've got a business unit we just started up to address what he just talked about that nobody wants to fill in forms online. It takes too much time. And then once you fill in that form, how long does it take to get back? If you get back, most of your software is wired or is set up. You have a 50% chance when a dealership sends back an email, you're in the junk mail. That's why you're only getting 10 or 15% engagement back in your email inquiries. You're actually in the junk mail half the time. Like big disparity here on how we have to communicate with the customer and how the market's kind of moved. Okay? So anyway, psychology is the study of reactions. Next P is patterns. He was talking about patterns, right? Where patterns are going to go, where they've been. A uh, couple of problems with patterns. A lot of us don't measure our, pa our patterns honestly, or we're looking at the wrong number. Uh, one of the things we talk about uh, in, in our trainings with internet leads is to first off measure how many people are even getting back to you. So your dealership's responding, 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 and for the most part, you probably only have a 30% re-engagement rate. So that person's not even a lead unless you're having a conversation. So we've got to figure out how to re-engage that customer. It's not hard to do it, but you've got to track the right numbers. Now, an intelligent person, if they're tracking honest numbers, when they find out something's not working, you're supposed to make some what? Some changes. Could you imagine having a dishonest GPS? You got a, so you got a pessimistic GPS. Maybe that's your manager. So you think it's right, but he's all, the GPS is always telling you you're a mile further away than what you are. You're still freaking lost, yes or no? Yes. Yeah. So now you're working for an optimistic, you got an optimistic GPS. That's great. Now it's telling you you're a mile closer than you are. You're still what? When I go rated R sometimes, I'll try not to because it's being filmed, okay? But you, you've got to be dead on, spot on with your assessment of what's happening because if not, it's a big head fake and a lot of us are just not honest with ourselves. We're not. In our own personal lives, in our own finances, in our health, in our money, and uh, in our businesses. So patterns, I'd like one word there, please, is honesty. Okay, honesty. All right, uh, next P is predictable. <coughs> If you get the other P's, the principles, the practices, the psychology, the patterns lined up, your business becomes a little more predictable. When it comes predictable, it becomes predictable, and you master a situation that's currently working, you got to know, again, the market's going to what? It's going to change again, and then you're back to looking at all the other stuff, or you're in an unpredictable situation again, day in, day out. So the last P is what it's all about, and it's called probability. Okay, and probability is odds. You got to get over the fact, obviously, you're not going to sell everybody. We probably could sell a few more if we tried. Um, you know, I, I joke about it, but it's true. In the reality of selling cars, and my OMVIC is still good. I'm registered with a dealer group here in Toronto. I've never stopped selling cars. I've been in the business since I was 16. Uh, my family owns a used car lot in London. Um, just because somebody has a driver's license doesn't mean they're sane. Yes or no? Yes. Not everybody fills out web forms sober. So we're dealing with a lot of craziness all the time. And some people that you can't get along with become your best friends, tough, tough customers, you know, they're all over the place. But we're not going to sell everybody a car. We have to try. And your people have got to be emotionally okay with that and built for that psychology of failure and success in order to kind of move themselves forward. So on the uh, front side of that sheet, if we can kind of go through this quick, I'm used to talking for three days, okay? <laughs> Literally, a lot of my classes are three days. So I'm going to try to go through some concepts here in about 45 minutes if I could. And uh, just to engage the group a little bit, can somebody read out the first point for me, please? What's the first point? Anybody? Thank you. Go ahead, Steve. Oh, we got three. Okay, so we got three readers, three volunteers. So you guys are going to read. Okay, you read first. Arthur. Dozens of brands, hundreds of models, and infinite number of car choices for iterative pricing and negotiation on constant pricing for those products. So who's my car dealers in the room? Where's, who's working in dealerships here? Okay, do you guys use any kind of a, a, a I'm not going to name systems here, promote anybody, but a system that will, uh, you know, price out used car inventory, that scrapes the internet for pricing, there's a few of them. How many times a week or a month are you guys repricing your used cars? At least once a week, right? Some people do it daily, all right? So you've got the lowest price, whatever. You know what? Check in five minutes. Somebody saw your car and did what? Okay, and if you actually go from brand to brand like I do, you gotta be honest, everybody builds a great car. So product and price right now is not the driving factors in your business. It can't be. Competition is way too stiff, the internet changes the numbers on you every five minutes. 
Is that fair to say or no? So I think that trend's pretty true. Marty, what's the next one? Uh, most buyers use the internet to research price or product information. People sometimes know more or think they do about the car than you. Yeah, you got a customer studying one car for six months, one model for six months, and you have 60 models to keep up with. So that's not going to be uncommon. They may, in fact, know the vehicle better than your salespeople. Okay, Steve? Yeah. You're often told in training to slow down in sales, but today our fastest transactions are often our most profitable. Can you grab my tea? It's a small one. It's a small tea. Uh, okay, so for those of you in the showroom right now, if you actually take a look at your gross profit on a three hour car deal versus a 45 minute car deal, where is the front end gross higher? Absolutely. And if you're a finance manager, you'd rather take a, a turn on a customer who took an hour to buy a car or somebody who took three hours to buy a car. This metric is completely opposite to when I started in the business where all was about stay off price, slow it down, stay off price, slow it down. And this mantra is still in our DNA. It's still being taught by a lot of training companies. And uh, you tell me, how much time does somebody have right now on a website? If you can't find something or if that website freezes, it's under, it's under 10 seconds for sure. Probably now it's under five. Okay. Um, do you go back to any company or business because you like the fact that the service is slow? <laughs> it's, it's, it's a joke, right? What's the difference between the, M, like the MTO or a DMV office, a government office, versus Amazon? It's, it's that. It's pace. It's flow. So, again, real world, somebody walks into your building physically. Salespeople can't find the car. The car they find is dirty. Gas light is on. Can't find a dealer plate. Can't find the keys. Can't find a manager. Can't find a, somebody doing appraisal. You know, we want to talk about cyberspace, and it's absolutely coming, but cyberspace still concludes they're still picking up a physical car. Your real space has to be lined up, and to me that's all training, and it's processes and commitment from your people. So um, anyways, we need to keep things what? Moving. moving along. I call it flow. We just got to keep things moving, okay? And one thing, when things stop, you have a problem, okay? So look at that whole flow and your whole pace in all departments and make sure it matches. Uh, Arthur, what's the next one? Okay, so again, I'm in dealerships all the time, training and selling and doing kind of, you know, that kind of stuff. Used car sales, who sold a used car like out of province? So what happens here, they go online, they look for a car, uh, you know, you happen to have the needle in your haystack, and so you, you sell that vehicle because they're looking for a needle in the haystack and you happen to have it. Local people, and again, to the car dealers in the room, I'd ask you this, because I've asked this again in, all, like in the last, um, geez, six months, you, I literally could just do a ring around North America on asking this question. What percentage of your new car customers or used car customers that are local buy the car online? Local. Within, and within 35, 40 minute drive, an hour drive, a half an hour? 40, 45% used cars buy local. Buy the car online, locally. That's strong. What is it for new? 92% of local customers buy local, correct? So what's happening still is a lot of people, you know, when they're looking at the car online, they're probably thinking, before I click purchase, maybe I should go physically check out the car, because maybe it's not like what I, what I really, you know, expect. And yeah, I've got pricing online, but maybe face-to-face -face I can compare it to something different. Now they will do, and exactly what he said, and it's a great analogy, start online, go physical, go back up and buy. Start physical, go online, come back down and buy. But there's this relationship of virtual and physical reality. Uh, a lot of people, I don't think, in the near future, they buy a car so infrequently, it's so much money, I don't think they're gonna go what I call from click to brick online. A lot of people. So I don't think you're going away. I don't think in our lifetime the franchise car deal is going away. When you watch automotive news or you read the you know, uh, Canadian Auto World, some of these people saying, oh, you know, it's a, it's a dying. I'm not sure if it's a dying. Manufacturers like to get rid of you guys. <laughs> I worked for manufacturers for seven years in my stints. I've done everything but own a new car franchise and put to together cars on assembly lines. I've done everything else. They would love to get rid of you. Yes or no? Hard to do with the Competitions Act, the franchise laws, and the fact that people seem to still physically want to walk into a store. But if they had their way, you'd all be gone. Is that fair to say? Yes, it is. This is why I don't do manufacturer training. It says on my website, don't call me if you're manufacturer, because I only work for car dealers, because that's my base. I'm not going to sit here and tell you something that might make somebody else happy. To me, it's just kind of reality of where it is. I'm a little bit too direct for my own good sometimes. Steve? It's funny, they'll buy a home. And I use that analogy. So let's look at a home. Between Google Earth, proximity Google Earth, coming down on top of a house now, Google Maps Street View, 
uh, fully disclosed listings from a real estate agent. Uh, could you or could you not buy a property sight unseen? Can you get a, vir a virtual tour inside a property, yes or no? And actually, there's more of that going on than there is cars. And it's 10 times the price. I'm not too sure why that is, but there is more of that going on. You're a real estate agent, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. is that pretty true? I find that um, so much of the advantage of, of purchasing something in person doesn't even know the price it's going to be because okay. it's mm -hmm. really low now. I find that people selling condos in Toronto have caught up to the retail price point, so it's yeah. not that much of a price advantage. Okay. But it's all about uh, the risk adversity of the condo, how much they want to risk buying something and the price difference with it may be worthwhile. Interesting. There you go. Okay, what's our next trend? What's the next one? Arthur. Yeah, many, many people buy something different than they originally requested. They're not order takers, so they often don't buy the exact car. They switch make, they switch model, they switch color, they go from new to used to a demo and all over the place. Is that not true? That happens in the difference between the virtual and physical reality when they actually end up in a store. Just something's not matching, something's not available, something doesn't seem to be the same. So switch cars are still there, and switch cars generally at the last moment are presented by humans. And the human has to know the inventory and the programs and the incentive and be professional. And so, again, sales process, I'm just coming back to that. You still have to have a sales process in a store that works. Marty? A growing number of people are credit curious or credit concerned, and approvals tend to be unpredictable. So we only have credit apps on our website and F&I not in our building process. This is a funny thing. I'm in dealerships all the time. If dealerships out there, who's in the room or when you're out in the you know, supplier chain, everybody's got a lot of people have credit apps on their website, yes or no? And of course, they're sitting in the finance office. You walk into a Canadian dealership today and see if salespeople are even allowed to have a credit application on their desk. Who here has, well, I'm not gonna ask you. I'm gonna bet nobody here has a credit application in their sales process. Okay? now. The Canadian banks are following the American banks. Do you think a bank wants to lend out money at Prime? No, they don't. How can they make any money? But what if I did this, which is exactly what's going on as best that I can tell. I don't want to commit myself here on tape. Um, banks, banks hold the, the keys to the scoring system. So what if I can score somebody like their risk, but I know they're not? What does allow the bank to do? Juice you. Yes or no? So uh, right now, because of a lot of dynamics in Canada and North America, there's a growing number of people that I don't, never get credit, get too much credit, are self-employed, their, their, their uh, credit utilization is weird on, on their Beacon score, or their bureau is off, and their major concern when they're dealing with you is not negotiating a price, it's picking out a car, and find, their negotiation is when they get what? Approved, Approved or think they can. Yeah. And if you look at your transaction times, which transaction time is shorter, a credit deal or a grind out price deal? A credit deal. A credit deal. Which profit is higher? Credit deal. 100%, yet we don't allow our salespeople to even talk about it. You want to talk about putting their hands behind their back? It's not even funny. So part of my sales process has always been how an intelligent salesperson can bring it up without offending anybody, because somebody could be paying cash, they might be curious, they might have a concern, but credit has to be part of what goes on in a showroom, because it's part of what happens in a transaction. And that trend, if you follow that demographic, is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but we're reluctant to move into that gap. And I honestly don't even understand it. I think it's a training piece. It's not understood. It's over-controlling F&I people. A lot of F&I departments run the dealership. They know the only, buddy, the only person making any money in the store is the F&I manager. They got you all by the tail. But what they don't seem to remember is until somebody sells a car, I don't get a turn. Yes or no? So odd dynamic. Odd dynamic when you actually look at it real world. What's the next one? Steve. Many people buy because they're connected with the salesperson on some level. If they don't like or respect you, they probably won't buy. Yes or no? 100% Yes. Uh, simple things like somebody sends you an email, a really long email, you reply short. You ever get a long text from a friend and they, you know, they can tell that you read it? You're like, oh my God, what do I do this right now? Because if you don't reply and don't reply with a message at length, it's a blow off, is it not? So mirroring, we have to mirror people by text, by email, on the phone, face to face, but basically, if they don't like somebody in the building, could it blow your chances? Yes, could they not like you online from something you did online? Yes, it happens a lot. So again, it's back to people, it's back to training in my estimation. Next one, Arthur.
What do you think? Are we more transaction ready now when we walk into a store than we were 10 years ago? Okay. Who's old enough here to remember, uh, I hate to even say that I clearly remember doing this a lot, for even for business trips. Who remembers booking trips through a travel agent? Okay, so somebody actually remember this fairly clear? Somebody want to explain how this used to work? Who wants to tell us a story? Okay. What used to happen is you pull up to a strip mall or walk in the mall, you sit down with somebody, they show you some brochures and some price sheets, and you sit there and whatever for a couple hours, and off of blind faith, you bought the trip. And then you got there, and every time I did it, it was never like what I expected. How much research can you do now on a trip before you ever get there? Online. You got Priceline, you got virtual you know, tours, you got everything. You walk around, you go, look, honey, it's exactly what we expected. We did such a good job. And now here's the deal. Uh, you are selecting online based on your own personal criteria. Some people want to pay this much. Some people want to pay that much. Some people want to pay this much and have that experience. Not many people want to pay this much and have that experience. Correct? Okay. So now let's do another analogy psychologically to online dating. And I don't know if you want to admit you do it because your friends probably do it, not you. But with online dating, um, when you start chatting on that website, is it really a lead yet? When does it become a hot lead? Well, before that. When you get them off the website, yes or no? Yes, and same with the car dealer. People are the most hostile on websites and behind the keyboards. It's anonymous. You start texting or calling, it's a lot more honest than behind a keyboard. Correct? Okay. So let's stick with online dating as a comparison to you know, the car business a little bit. And so the selection is done online, everything looks good, and you meet in the Starbucks or wherever you're meeting for your coffee or tea, and you crack a little joke, and the other person smiles, and they got no front teeth. But they had front teeth on their profile. Is that a problem or not? Now here's the deal. If you posted your picture with no front teeth, you still would have a date, but you'd be dating somebody that's into somebody with no front teeth. <laughs> Where the problem comes is when your virtual image doesn't match your, the reality. So when we book appointments and bring people in, if your story when they land is at all different than what you told them on the phone or on the internet, all that work and effort goes where? So you can't have any discrepancies between the story online, the story on the phone, the story by text, on the pictures, on the paperwork, to when they physically show up. Because it's exactly like online dating. It's got to be exactly matching. Yes or no? Or you've wasted a ton of what? Time and money. Anyways, just a thought. Next one. Marty. You can test drive a car in VR and get a price or trade value from AI or from a salesperson online. But a physical test drive and or face one or the other, would that be fairly true? Yeah, they're coming for the pricing or the drive. Is that pretty true with almost everybody still locally? I'm going to challenge you to do this, and you know, whatever percentage you think it is, go to your deliveries in the last six months with your sales team, have a meeting, and say who here remembers selling these cars, who was local, who here bought the car sight unseen or did the pricing sight unseen and just literally came in to complete paperwork. Local people. I mean, they didn't do anything. Face to f they came in and just to pick it up. I'm going to tell you what that number's going to be. It's zero. It's zero. Either pricing negotiations, credit, or car was done face to face. Some of it was maybe done online. That piece was done face to face with your local customers. It is actually zero. Yes or no? I'm telling you that's what it is if you actually look at it. It might have started somewhere, but it was something they finished. Where am I going with that concept? You're going nowhere. Online, online purchases are not new. Jerry Barg in Cambridge, Ontario, client of mine, we still had Barg Automotive 20 years ago, had online buying. It's not new, but something about a car, the confusion of it, whatever, local people must be thinking this. You know what? I could click, but maybe I should, you know, maybe I should try that car out. Maybe I should look at this guy. Maybe I should check out service. Because they know you're all, most of you, 20 minutes away from, half an hour away from where they are. So am I about online? Absolutely. We, like I said, our business is on, about it, no question. But finalization for local people for some reason, and I'm not talking with a Tesla or a Genesis when there's only one dealer, and so they can do one price. I'm talking when you got, how many GM dealers do you think are within a 50 kilometer radius, 50 mile radius from here? It's about 40. So if somebody wants to shop, they can really what? 
thinking they're going to find that deal of a century. So until that model changes, th that model changes, with consolidation by the factory or other dealers, we're kind of, we're kind of where we are. But you've got to get your online game ready. I'm not denying anything that he said. And people come in with Unhaggle and Car Cost Canada and True Car in the States and all that. But there's still, and we look at numbers in the US, like Carvana. Do you have any idea the consolidation that's happened in the States and the population centers in the US and how those markets are so different than here? You hear a dealership down there doing 2,000 cars a month, it's not even unheard of. But then ask them how many franchise dealers like that are in the area on a population basis. It's about one tenth, maybe, of Canada. Maybe. So the US model, when you look at it, is a little bit, it's a little bit different than here, just based on our geography. But I'm, but I'm not denying to keep up, and I'm not denying the changes. I'm saying right now, manage your business. Because while you sit here and wait for the incoming, you got problems going on right now. Steve. You can waste hours avoiding price and build value on the wrong car. The buyer can't afford building value on the wrong car makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Are your salespeople allowed to talk price and payment during the sale in their own way? Anyhow, somehow, or have you pull, totally pulled that away from them? I don't know. There is a sweet spot between staying off price, which is a problem, because it's an elephant in the room. Customers want to know what? And getting into exact price too early when you have no rapport or selection. So I call it maybe staying off exact price, but you've got to make my estimation, credit application, and discussion of price and payment part of the sales process, possibly, if that's what the customer wants to do. I don't know. Arthur, what's the next one? And in most stores I'm in, 20, 25 a month, these opportunities are a total now of sales calls, emails, and walk-ins. So a rep gets maybe one a day, one or two a day. And I've got some clients that are closing 65% of all their traffic that physically shows up with people measuring it accurately. Two-thirds. You are one of them. Yes or no? When we first met, Marty, I always talk, when you're in the room, how many cars a month were you doing when we first met? You were good. At a, he was at an Nissan um, Infinity store. Yeah. Not far from here. How many cars a month were you delivering? Twelve to fifteen, yeah. and within less than a year, yeah. what did what did your average go to? Three to five, three to five. And what was your best month? Fifteen. What was your average transaction time? Forty-three hours. How much? Forty-three. From meet and greet to F and I, forty-three minutes. I track it because I always put it on our on the customer statement sheet, like time in minutes and how much. Time. Before you met me, were you trained to stay off price? Yeah. And were you trained to, to slow it down? Well, and were you trained to inundate the customer with product knowledge? What happened when you made it a little simpler and more effective in those areas? You it got a lot easier to walk on price. It's a psychology. So again, it's just where the business has been, where it is, that gap. Okay, Steve, what's the next one? Uh, 20 to 25 opportunities per month. Right? We just did that one, Steve. Yeah. We just did that one. It's okay. Next one. Everyone's attention spans are shorter or our expectations for simple information are higher. As a buyer slowing me down and avoiding my price talk, do people have short attention spans? Are they getting shorter all the time? One of the red flags in your showroom is when the customer's on their phone. If you see customers on their phone a lot, they've either been totally disengaged by the sales rep or something has happened with credibility. So a lot of it is you want to keep it moving, kind of like I am with this talk, to force the person to engage with you and keep them off their what? I've had to change how I teach. It's why I don't use PowerPoint. Because I will lose you if I use PowerPoint. So, and I'm not knocking your PowerPoint. <laughs> you need to do what you're doing because you've got a lot more data than I'm doing here, a lot more data. But if you walk around your showroom and your customers are on their phone, and my goodness, if the customer is alone, what is the first thing people pick up when they're left alone? When's the last time any of my car dealer friends saw something really good happen for you when the customer went on their phone? <laughs> not much. Arthur? Yes or no? Yeah. Yes. So appointments are still a very simple, basic metric. Now, I don't care if it's a repeat, a referral, a be back, somebody you've networked with, somebody you've met originally on social media. Those people tend to book what? Okay. Appointments. And so do sales calls that you handle properly and internet leads. And if you look at your mix of business on your floor, how skilled and how much business is your average rep getting from repeats and referrals and be backs and networks and social media and sales calls and internet leads? And all those people, all those people right now, most of them anyways, not all of them, before they buy, still seem to want to physically what? Walk in. Now once they walk in, would you say a test drive and a price, a proposal of some type, trade or not, 
test driving proposal is, is important. Okay? If somebody comes into your dealership but doesn't get a test drive or a price, what do you think they're saying when they go back to their car? Waste of time, because you actually gave them nothing they couldn't have got off their what? Now let's talk about that for a second. Basic car sales, selling, uh, test drive, right? Physical involvement with the product, a presentation, a walkthrough on a house, anything you want to talk about that way. Um, again, going through the list, you have a salesperson that maybe is a little lazy. It's easier to sit down and look at numbers and dig out a car. Yes or no? You got bad weather we got to deal with. Uh, you got cars you can't find. Again, you got cars with no gas. You can't find the keys. You can't find the plates. You maybe kind of backed up trying to take a copy of the license. Uh, you have a manager that won't walk the floor and say hello to people. A sales manager ambassador is walking the floor. Hey, going, hey, good morning, folks. How, what car are you driving? Uh, well, oh, come on, you're here. I'll get the keys. Could a manager, just through a two second patent chat, get a customer to go for a test drive in a really loving, polite way, yes or no? When you're in a restaurant and somebody comes around and says, hey, how's the dinner, are they okay? Does their experience get better or worse? If that same manager is by the door, does, can, he, can he or she catch any problems that have happened? So we have to get involved early and often and not just last minute, would we agree? So test drive is the only step that really matters when they're there physically. And then now here's the other side. What if, um, what if they come in and uh, they get a test drive but no proposal? Do some people buy a car without a drive? Some people do buy a car without a drive. Does anybody buy a vehicle without verifying pricing? No. So now we have another culture problem. Oh, don't show him numbers. We don't think he's buying today. <laughs> yes or no? Of course. So now we won't show, we don't know how to do a range quote. We don't do, there's a lot of different quotes you can do that aren't gonna hurt you in any way. If you decide not to put out numbers, it's a catch 22. You've guaranteed they can't what? So they might buy without a drive. They can't buy without numbers, correct? What happens to your closing ratio when people go for a test drive and get numbers? Goes up. So now here's another lie of the industry. You track those numbers separately. If, you, if they did all this research, or did any research at all, and some people I know use us for the research, but most people do some research. They do all this research, they show up either a fresh walk in or an appointment, and um, they only go for a drive. This is what most people do. In most cases, that same franchise as you is sitting with another half an hour from them. They go, well, I was already there for a drive. I think I'll go to the other one to get the price. And it's a two-piece puzzle now, test drive and proposal. So when you only do a test drive with no price, you're almost guaranteeing they're going to do what as soon as they walk in the other store? Yes? Probably. Now let's reverse the problem. You're doing pricing but no test drives. Now you're pricing, that's, a, that's another problem, is it not? So really, unless you do both, you've done nothing. If you actually metric that out, but you know, on your CRM, right? Oh, we did a test drive. Oh, nice job. Really? Nice job? You just set it up for who? The other store. You just closed their deal because you wouldn't even show him what. So let's say you decide to put out a range quote. So he says, I'm not buying for six months. Hey, no problem. You got seven minutes, no obligation. No obligation, I want to show you something. And you sit down and quickly, not an hour, quickly, like if you go from test drive and it takes you 15, 20, 30, 45 minutes to get a price or a trade value. What do you think is happening to the excitement here at this point? You're losing your credibility. It's like giving somebody a bowl of soup in a restaurant. Oh, the spoon. Yeah, right. A uh, spoon. And as he's looking me to look for a spoon, and this thing's cooling off, what's happening to his likelihood to tip me? To buy a dessert or come back? So every time we make a mistake, we could lose enough credibility, we lose that sale. Now, if you're in a restaurant, if you're in a restaurant, and you only brought the bowl of soup, with the spoon, let's say you're pretty good 80% of the time. That means 20% of the time the soup comes out no spoon. You're in a business, are you not? But somehow we're okay with half our customers not going for a drive, can't find the car, can't find the manager, can't get a number, can't get appraisal, why don't you come back, can't get this. A lot of dealers, I'm not knocking you, you guys could all be great, a lot of dealers are only car dealers, maybe 60% of the time. Because the other 40%, they're okay just not having it quite go right. And here's the biggest problem. The better this research gets, and the more they'll be able to do the whole decision-making selection process online, that means more and more people, when they show up, are ready to what? Pull the trigger. You have to be better today at retail, so much more so than when I was in it, when I first started. When I was 19, as kind of a jack-of-all-trades, master of nothing at Forest City Chrysler in London, the sales manager used to go like this to me. I was kind of a lot kid and doing whatever. He'd go like that, which meant I was supposed to go pull a car in behind a customer's car and pretend I was reorganizing a lot. And pulling a car behind a customer's car while I reorganized a lot was a way to make him so he couldn't leave. 
and maybe 90 minutes later, you would just see them go like this, okay, fine, I'll, I'll take it. And here's why. They had to go to dealer to dealer to dealer to do basic research. Now they can do it all where? So you, you got to be so on point now when people show up, it's not funny. They, and, and people's expectations, let's get realistic. Is a customer always right? They're not always right. Most people are pretty freaking insane anymore. You say slightly the wrong word, and all of my course books have a rated R at the beginning because I talk like a normal human being still. You say slightly the wrong word with people. People are triggered like this. Are you getting training on what words trigger people today during a car deal? Like asking a woman, is anybody helping you make the decision? <laughs> it happens every day. Asking somebody young, who else is involved in the decision making process? They both think right there, you just suggested, you don't think they can what? Big discrepancies when it actually comes down to us closing the customer when they can. So if you have work switchboard lately, and you, you know, and you have the receptionist says, hey, I'll put you over here. Who's your salesperson? Way more than half say they can't what? I don't remember. So we do all this time and effort, and repeats and referrals are so important, and then we kind of drop the ball and maybe there's a lot of turnover, maybe the person's not you know, memorable, but repeats and referrals for any company is still the holy grail. Yes or no? Absolutely, don't forget that business. You know, In the service drive, repeats and referrals keep you in business. CSI in the showroom is for the manufacturer to drive traffic, so it shows up in the surveys and articles in a high spot, so it looks like you're a good brand. But CSI in the shop is what keeps you open. Arthur? How many hours a day do you think the average retail car salesperson is actually productive, like most of us had to be productive at other jobs? I, mean, I don't know, but it's, right? Do we waste a lot of time? Oh my God, there's so much, there's so much wasted, wasted time in a showroom, it's not even funny. It's not even funny. And I'm gonna, I, you know, people complain about not making enough money, and I would never do this, okay, I'm just talking. On an hourly basis, car salespeople are overpaid so much it's not funny when you actually look how many hours they what? And then you have your top, top, top one that's maybe underpaid because she's so good, she's so productive. But most people, they're not really doing much in a showroom all day long. Right? So in comes the fear of the dealer. Faraday cage the showroom, no more Facebook. So the odd guy that actually is using it for sales can't do it. Is there another one there? Is there a lot of ways to recontact people? There's so many ways it's not funny, okay? So anyways, um, if you want to just go to the back, one more little thing and then I'm gonna finish up here. This is about my 45 minutes, just trying to keep things on point. Can you do a triangle? I wanna show you something, just do a triangle. And if I had a whiteboard, I'd draw it out, but just do a little triangle. And um, if you wanna make it a three level triangle, like a pyramid with three chunks, three levels this way. And then the last one on the bottom, the big one, can you break it up into three squares or three, three chunks? Okay, so you should have one, two, three, four, five areas in the triangle. Okay, in our business right now, uh, that bottom half, that bottom piece with the three chunks is uh, roughly, roughly 10 car a month salespeople. So the majority of the business is still doing about 10 cars a month. The three, and I'm gonna show you this is a little depressing, a little bit, but then I'm gonna talk about the customer experience. Um, in one of those chunks, about a third of a lot of showrooms is new hires. The new hire may or may not have training, but they got a great attitude, okay? The middle chunk is a, some of these people now also another third of that bottom of that average is what I call kind of complacent. Okay? And the other chunk on the other side is what I call special and negative. And you're, whoever's laughing is because you know who I'm talking about. Okay? So what happens is the special negative person that's a little bit of an attitude cancer for the store and for management, if allowed to stay, will completely corrupt, corrode, and destroy any new hires that come in. Because they recognize they're going to start taking their traffic a little bit. So they're going to get them to quit, get fired, be inept, get depressed, whatever. And this is on the bottom between the complacents and the new hires and the negative specials is probably in a lot of stores more than half the floor. I'd say probably two thirds of the store. The next level up is about 20 cars a month. I call this level great. I tell new people to watch these people very well because they're going to give you a little bit of roadmap on how to be successful. And the top top is what they call the three percenter and it's you know, 5% of our business or whatever it is that does maybe 30 cars a month or more. Does anybody know um, any salespeople that you've ever worked with or do work with that have an assistant? Yeah, 
And the claim to fame on that, Joe Girard, who just passed away uh, about a month ago, good friend of mine, Joe Girard, still in the Guinness Book of World Records, I'm the only living guy to ever do any work with Joe Girard that still holds the Guinness Book of World Record title as the number one salesperson ever. And the way that he sold in the 60s and 70s, you couldn't do it now, actually a lot of it's illegal. <laughs> okay, but the guy's psychology was absolutely phenomenal. His process though, you just couldn't do it anymore. But I'll tell you all he did, massive lead generator, he had a system built so when you came in, you physically went for a what? Test drive. And he was the one to serve what? That's what he did. That has not changed. Lead generation, test drive proposal to this point is still not a lot different. Again though, some might start online, some might start physically, but the way it concludes, they have to do it all like about a three-piece puzzle. Anyways, where I'm going with is this. If I walk into a dealership today, that's who I'm going to meet. So if you look at that triangle, I just want to give you a little bit of insight on where this is going. Um, if I walk into a dealership and meet a new hire with no training, I'm going to get a great attitude, but a very, very confusing process. And most of the time, they're off with the manager looking for guidance. Is that true or not? So I don't know what your training process is for new people, but whoever's doing it in the store or wherever, address it. What if they meet Mr. or Mrs. Complacent? You got a 50-50 chance it's going to go okay. Okay? What if they meet Mr. Special and Negative? And he doesn't like something you said. Like, you recognize you want way too much for your trade. The price you just said is ridiculous. The payment's ridiculous. I don't like your culture. I don't like anything about what you're, yeah, you're like that guy. These people just are waiting to write you off. So I'm going to tell you right now, in most dealerships, that is who's waiting on traffic. Now, this, t this next level, the 20 car person, you're going to be very lucky to walk into a company, even a real estate company, and meet a top 20 percenter, because a lot of them are mostly too busy dealing with their own what? Those people aren't really available for all the walk-ins, all the emails, all the sales calls because they've got their own pipeline, correct? And the top, top, top people, I call them angels at the top of that pyramid, you don't get in unless you're referred in because they only deal with their what? So looking at that triangle, where's your only hope? Yes. That have never worked at another dealership, have no bad habits, that you as a competent manager can groom from the grass up. It's your only hope. And you hope that new hire becomes awesome and pushes everybody out, becomes a 20 percenter, you bring somebody else in new. But then we hear this all the time, a lot of time, you know, training's a waste of the eh, dee. <laughs> so what are, you putting, what are you putting your hope in? What if the 20 percenter, 3 percenter gets headhunted and leaves? Who's ever seen that collapse a dealership? <laughs> Not to mention any names. <laughs> Anyways. Um, the trend is your friend, uh, you know, if you don't adapt or die, all that stuff is cool. But while you're watching the trends, you got to pay attention to your business because that's right now what's putting groceries in the fridge and what's running the heat and hydro. Don't, don't not pay attention to what's going on in the store. And don't give up hope because you know what, your belief system runs everything. And if you start believing the sky's falling, the odd thing starts to happen. Your sky starts to what? It starts to fall. So watch, watch your, your own psychology day to day in your business because that's really what's driving it. Make sense? Okay, any thoughts or questions for me? Anything you want to ask or discuss? Nothing? You've got to have questions for Dwayne. Great job, Jim. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. All done. And the millions around the world, put your hands together for Jason Harris. <laughs> thank you. Harris. <laughs> Uh, hey everyone, I'm Jason Harris. Uh, thank you so much for coming out to the event, guys. Uh, we really appreciate it. You know, this takes a, a lot of time, a lot of effort, and you know, I couldn't do it without such an amazing team. Uh, you see some of them floating around out here. If you see them later today, you know, give them a high five, shake on the hand, pat on the back. Um, really, we couldn't do this without them. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm originally from the state, so please don't hold that against me. I've been in Canada for roughly about 10, almost going on 11 years now, and uh, I've got to watch the Canadian automotive industry really kind of change over the past decade. I've been in the automotive business for the last 15 years. I've done everything from salesperson to F&I to sales manager to general manager to dealer principal. So I've had an opportunity to really kind of deep dive to operations at pretty much every single level. Currently right now, my endeavor is uh, digital dealership solutions. It is a marketing agency designed specifically for automotive dealerships, just like yours. And uh, today what I wanted to talk about, guys, was uh, Facebook. 
And I know that Facebook marketing and advertising um, has been spoken a lot about the last couple of years, but I really want to get even deeper into it and really deep dive into strategy. So if you guys are here and you're in charge of your marketing strategy at your dealership, get that pen out. Oh, I see already. <laughs> Get that pen out, get ready, because we're really going to dive into what it takes to really develop out a next level Facebook uh, marketing strategy. This is one of my favorite quotes, and I like to really kind of start off our strategy talk today with this. You know, creative without strategy is called art. <laughs> the time I've been in this industry, I've had the opportunity to meet a lot of artistic individuals, <laughs> a lot of artistic agencies. Creative with strategy, guys, that's what we call marketing. And it starts with the strategy. In fact, you're gonna find out today, we're gonna spend more time talking about the strategy, audience de development, and objectives before we even start talking about creative. But before we do that, this is one of my favorite scenes to really kind of set the tone. Of a great movie called Moneyball, which is obviously very appropriate for where we are. <laughs> Guys, we need to take a very similar approach to the way that we spend our marketing dollars. All right, um, I have, currently we, we work with little over 70 dealerships in Ontario, a handful of them also in the US. And uh, I got a group of them together at the end of uh, 2018. And I asked them, you know, what do they expect from us as an agency moving into 2019? And uh, this, is, this is what they said. More results for no more money. <laughs> Does that sound familiar? <laughs> that was the challenge that was set in front of us, was more, more results with as little money as humanly possible. And for the last 10 years, that is exactly what we've been looking for. I've been called a professional sandbox hunter because it's exactly what we do. We find those sandboxes, those spaces in between the cracks that provide us an incredibly high engagement at a low cost. And we take advantage of those spaces until, well, we just can't afford to take advantage of them anymore and then we have to find another sandbox. Right? The way that we are structuring our advertising right now, our marketing efforts right now, ultimately just has to change. And, the, and one of the ways that we need to change that right out of the gate is that, guys, we have to set goals. Like, if you guys are in charge of your marketing efforts at your dealership, you need to be intimate, I mean intimate, with your dealership's goals and objectives. And guys, a goal and objective is not, I just want to sell more cars, because, duh. <laughs> All right. It needs to be very, very specific. It needs to be down to, which model of car, which trim of car, all right? 
You guys also need to know your own inventory levels. Yes, if you're in charge of marketing, you need to know inventory levels. I can't tell you how many times I've seen ads run for cars they don't even have, <laughs> right? We need to cut all of that excess spend down so that we can give the best results humanly possible back to our dealership. And to do that, we need to understand those goals and objectives, not only in your new car department, but your used car department, your parts department, your service department. You need to intimately know those goals and objectives. And if guys, if, you, if, they do, if, the, if the dealership doesn't know those goals and objectives, then you need to be assisting them with that. Before getting into creative, we have to find those goals. Then we need to let those goals define our audience. Does that kind of make sense? Let me kind of walk you through one of these, all right? For example, um, I want to sell more 2019 Rogue SLs, all right? I got some Nissan dealerships here, right? One, two, three. All right, I got some, I got some Nissan dealerships. Look, guys, every single one of your manufacturers, you all have a vehicle that's very, very similar to this, right? And in most cases, has very dis three very distinctive audiences. A, a younger audience with an active lifestyle, a smaller family audience, and also a retiree audience as well, right? But if I'm gonna sell rogue SLs, and I wanna increase my traffic by 25%, then guys, you need to deep dive into that. Find out who from your dealership is buying these cars, okay? This is not the pray and spray method. That's done. If I hear that one more time, I swear I'm gonna lose it, okay? We need to deep dive and really understand who, who's buying these cars. Once we've defined that audience that's gonna help us meet those goals, then and only then, only then, can we actually start talking about creative. Now let's talk about creative. <laughs> okay. Uh, for the longest time, we've been under the strategy that one ad, one piece of creative, meets everybody's needs, wants, and desires. And that's absolutely insane. In a world of everything moving incredibly fast and being able to create creative, I mean, right now, we were making pieces of creative while we were talking, guys. Like, it's insane to run one single piece of ad out there and assume that one piece of creative is gonna work for every single, per every single audience you have. You need to be audience specific in your creative, right? That means that retiree folks, they get a very specific piece of creative. That younger lifestyle folks are gonna get a very specific piece of creative. All right, that small family, what do you think that creative is gonna look like? You guys, like, you guys start thinking about this, all right? Know your audience, do it for the audience, all right? That's absolutely key. And look at the engagement, all right? I am so sick and tired of talking about clicks and impressions and CTR rates and, guys, that it doesn't mean squat, all right? You need to look at the overall engagement, okay? We need to look at the likes, the shares, the clicks, the comments, the video watches, the time on landing pages, the form fills, the phone calls, and yes, the floor traffic, okay? All of that is the collective engagement of the one piece of creative that you put out there. And it is your job as your dealership's marketing expert to know all of that and to be able to translate that out. That's why I love that money ball scene. Because I mean, it's, it, literally, if you're deep diving into it, that is what your day looks like. <laughs> Your day is just pouring over analytics to ensure that your creative is hitting that right audience and that they're engaging, at, get engaging with it at the highest level. Now, guys, we've got a strategy for you, and that's what we're going to go through next. Facebook. Um, on your guys' table, uh, Facebook could, guys couldn't, ma they couldn't make it today, but they donated some great mugs. So everybody gets a little <laughs> take home, all right? Uh, fun fact about uh, those mugs, you can't actually order any of this product online. It actually has to be ordered and delivered directly from the California location. So um, I am told that the blue ones in the back <laughs> are the ones that Zuckerberg actually drinks his coffee out of. I, I don't know if that's true or not, but sounds cool. <laughs> um, I actually dig the black and white ones a little better. Uh, <laughs> so let's talk about Facebook. Let's talk about Instagram. Guys, when I talk about it, it's kind of one and the same. All right, the facts. Canadians spend three to four hours a day looking at their mobile device. Three to four hours a day <laughs> staring at this little tiny device. Like, that's, that's kind of crazy, right? Um, one in every four minutes is spent on Facebook or Instagram. Like, one in every four minutes. Guys, these are Canadian stats, okay? I'm not pulling this stuff from the US. These are Canadian stats. Actually, Canada actually has the most active Facebook users in the entire world. All right, as a per capita, per country, we have the most Facebook. In fact, actually in Ontario, 67% of all people in Ontario have a social media account. 
So when I walk into a dealership and I hear somebody say, ah, you know, I just don't think my customer's on there. So I put my head down and go, bullshit. <laughs> all right, they're on there, all right? We all know who the fastest growing audience on social media is, right? On Facebook? It's that 45 plus audience. Instagram's on fire right now. I mean, how many people have, have started to slowly move over from Facebook and is now incredibly active on Instagram? Raise your hands real quick, right? Like, things are moving at a space. That doesn't mean you forget about Facebook, please don't, okay? I think of Facebook, when you think of Facebook, I like to think of Facebook as like that local pub. You know, when you were a kid, you had that like one bar that you kind of always went to. It seems like here in the GTA, you guys all had this one club or a series of clubs that you always kind of went to when you were 19 or 25 or 20 something, all right? As you get older, you will come back for that nostalgic purposes, okay? So Facebook ain't going away. Instagram is active right now. Here's a fun fact, guys, a little one for you. Thursdays and Fridays, online engagement is 18% higher. We're looking at capitalizing every single penny you have. I am never asking someone to increase their budgets, all right? It is my job to take whatever budget they have and to take full, full advantage of that. Now, with that said, there are budgets that are reasonable, okay? Um, guys out there, if, if you're spending 500 bucks on Facebook and Instagram, just, just stop. Just we could, this, if we just lit it on fire, the smoke itself would actually bring more engagement. <laughs> okay, like get into the pool. Okay, don't stick your foot in it. All right, really get into that pool, and it is an impressively impressive pool. It really is. All right, in our industry, we love three-letter acronyms and four-letter words. Um, <laughs> you guys are all laughing because you know it's true. It is. Our entire industry is made of three-letter three-letter acronyms and four-letter words. All right, um, so we, we decided to come up with our own three-letter acronym. Now, this is going to be your strategy, okay? It's air. Think of it, that's what you guys are going to breathe. It's what you're going to own. As a marketing person, this is, this is going to be your essence, okay? Air stands for awareness, interest, and remarketing. We've got to keep thinking about that. Every single time that I go and I get a goal and objective from my parts manager or a goal and objective from my service or my new car manager, all right? I start developing out those audiences, all right? I gotta start thinking how I'm gonna generate awareness, how I'm gonna drive interest, and how I'm gonna develop a remarketing strategy that's gonna make sure they actually come into my dealership. Call to action. All right, we're gonna start, oops, there we go. We're gonna start with awareness, okay? Multiple audiences on awareness are absolutely key. So right now we're gonna talk about audience, okay? So at the awareness level, all right, we are going to use the example of single male females between the ages of 22 to 30 with active lifestyles. This is skiing, hiking, snowboarding, all right? This is in your PMA. Oh, by the way, let's talk about PMAs real quick. Um, if you guys are currently advertising outside of your PMA, unless your message is so insanely unique that not another dealership can actually duplicate it, you are just simply marketing for them, not for you. And I appreciate it. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> we've actually seen it happen. We've actually seen competing dealerships, all right, side by side, spend a buttload of money into another's market, and yet they're the ones that actually reap the benefit of that spend, okay? So keep it within your space, all right? Trust me, there's a lot, there's a lot of fish in your own pond. Do not go outside of your pond. It's really not necessary, all right? Uh, maybe a multiple audience, parents between the ages of 30 and 45 with two kids at home, all right, under the age of 15. Guys, this is how granular we can get. Right? You need to spend time to develop these audience. Male retirees between the ages of 55 and 65. All right? um, we're going to target people that have gone to vehicle-specific websites, uh, traffic, that are lookalikes. Anybody, uh, anybody in here has done Facebook advertising and create a lookalike audience? Okay. You've got to take advantage of those lookalike audience. Okay? At the awareness level, this is where we want to create the lookalike audience. And the reason that we do that at the awareness level is because it's where I'm going to, if you think of it kind of like a, like a fountain, all right? we're going to fill up this big tub and the tub's going to flow down into our interest level and then continue to flow down into our remarketing level, right? So at the awareness level, all right, we're going to throw in existing customers. We're going to do some lookalikes off of those. Guys, when you throw in your existing customer database into your lookalike audience, divide them out to being vehicle specific. Don't just take your whole database of 6,000 people and just dump it in and say, ah, I want those lookalikes. Like take the time and actually divide them out. It doesn't, you know, literally just hit the sort button on Excel. You're good, okay? Um, <laughs> landing page traffic, all right? We want to create lookalikes also based on our landing page traffic. Okay. 
This is what we want to serve up to them all right, at the awareness level. A quick 15 to 30 second video presenting your product or service. Okay? Video, and I really mean video, guys. All right, the average cost of a video view right now at our, in our office is between three to five cents per view. Okay? Three to five cents. That's incredibly cheap. <laughs> and it allows me to really test, does anybody actually really care about the message that we're actually putting out there? Okay? Well, obviously, we're taking, this is actually real time, guys. This is what this would look like. We're using a uh, Facebook Insta experience. Does anybody know what a Facebook Insta experience is? Don't get confused with Insta, Instagram. I know it's kind of a weird word. I'm not sure why they selected that. All right. Um, in the past, you've had the one-two punch when it comes to ads, right? Here's my ad. Click it. Boom. Go to my landing page. One-two. That's it. Okay. Facebook's got a great option right now. And you understand there's 20-some-odd ad formats, 11 different ways to place it. There's a lot, a lot of different options there, right? The Instagram experience is a great place, right? Or sorry, the Facebook Instant Experience is a great place. It gives you a one, two, three punch, okay? First I click on it, it opens up a small micro page, and that's actually what you're seeing right here, okay? I, get, I wet your whistle, give you a little taste of what the next experience is going to be, okay? That gets you kind of sucked in, as you see as you flow down to the bottom, that's where that next call to action is, that build and price or shop our inventory, okay? So instead of the one, two punch, it's the one, two, three punch, okay? <laughs> we want to build out video pieces for each individual audience, okay? This one, obviously, we targeted a active lifestyle audience. Actually, we're pretty broad with the age here on this particular one, simply because there wasn't a heck of a lot of budget, so we didn't necessarily have enough budget to actually split it out. Um, optimization, how, how do you want to optimize that awareness level campaign, okay? Like I said, video views is it. Uh, optimize an ad, uh, ad delivery for 10 second video views. Actually, you do have the option of going three second or 10 second video views in Facebook. D I would not recommend going three second, even though Facebook says like your brain can actually recognize what they're saying in a three second period. All right, I really recommend to optimize for 10 seconds. Um, low frequency, all right? Frequency is actually really the, thing, the key thing here. And the funny thing is that's actually not a new strategy, by the way, right? Frequency has been around for a long time. When you guys bought radio ads, it was all about frequency. When you bought TV ads, it was all about frequency. You weren't going to jump into a radio ad or jump into a TV ad, all right, and only run it one time with some, expecting something to happen. So low frequency against those audience, because again, we're testing to see who's actually biting here, all right? We want to keep a frequency around two to four times over a 30-day period, all right? How do, they, how do we get frequency? That's the reach, how many people you're targeted, divided by how many impressions there are, okay? Now, all based on your budget, right? Okay, again, we're, we're, we're trying to optimize for frequency, not ad spend, okay? So if your budget can only give you the ability to reach 5,000 people with maintaining that frequency level, then that's what you do, all right? If your budget gives you the opportunity to reach 15,000 people and maintain that frequency, then that's what you do, okay? That means that you're not diluting, all right, the actual effectiveness of the strategy. You're maintaining the effectiveness of the strategy. All right, interest level. So now I created awareness, right? I measure the engagement of the awareness level. In this case, video views, likes, shares, comments, clicks, the whole shebang, the whole full thing, okay? That is the one thing I do love by starting with a video though, is because we can actually measure how much time you actually spend and watch the video. So if you go through the full three, th 30 seconds, cool. I'll move you down to the next level. If you clicked on and opened up the little micro page, cool. I'll move you down to the next level, right? If you take specific actions like sharing or comment, cool, I'm gonna move you down to the next level, all right? But if you don't, then I'm done with you. It's cool, all right? I spent roughly five to 10 cents to find out if you actually gave a crap about the message I had out there. That's a pretty great ROI, just to see if you're even interested. Now, if you are interested, this is where we're gonna get pretty thick, okay? Let's talk, let's talk about the audience, all right? Now we wanna go people that are interested we don't want to create awareness, people are actually interested. So people that have already gone to your website, website traffic that's already showing interest, right? So we're gonna put that into that bucket. Landing page traffic, hey, the same thing. They visit the landing page, we need to put that into that bucket as well. And of course, awareness level video views, just like we were talking about, we're gonna put that into our bucket, all right? And we'll create an interest level audience bucket. Now what does that creative look like? This is where you're gonna get a little thicker with your creative, all right? I recommend three to four, actually, <laughs> Since I've written this one out, we're probably closer to six to eight pieces of creative at that interest level. 
right? And the reason for that is because we're gonna optimize this interest level for a long period of time. Actually, at this level, we're, we're marketing to them about 30 to 60 days, right? Um, we know that the shopping process, all right, for a buyer is 60 to 90 days long, okay? So putting a single piece of creative out there and just hoping that they're going to engage with that at that right specific time is just never gonna work, okay? So we wanna stretch, we wanna stretch this bad boy out. This is where we really wanna get into features, okay? If you notice, not price, I don't have price up here, okay? It's nothing but straight features because I'm trying to determine at what level are they actually interested in, all right? If I put in my interest level campaign, if I'm putting four to six to eight pieces of creative in there, how many pieces of creative do I want them to engage with before I take them down to that next level, okay? Um, again, here we want to take them over to um, uh, the clicks here, either a call to action for a shopping experience. Um, Instagram ad stories right now, we're crushing it right now in Instagram ad stories. Um, Instagram came out with a great format a while back is that you can actually within your story actually put a swipe up function. But to do so, you needed 10,000 followers, okay? Instagram put that out there. It went really, really well. They went, hmm, we can monetize this. <laughs> and that's exactly what they did. So roughly about six or nine months ago, they launched this. We waited a little bit. <laughs> Here's the thing with Facebook and Instagram. They like to test a lot of things. They'll put something out there. If they feel like it don't work, they'll remove it. <laughs> and they'll do it really quickly, and sometimes they can tell you they're going to do so. Optimizations. Now, since we're at the interest level, it's not necessarily about how much of the video they consume. It's about the actual next level engagement, all right? Did they shop my inventory? Did they click over to my landing page, okay? We're gonna, did they, did they swipe through my carousel, okay? Now we're gonna start getting specific. We're gonna start optimizing for placement, okay? There are 11 different placements on Facebook and Instagram, all right? Between them, themselves, their network, desktop, mobile, all right? There are 11 different options, all right, to optimize for. Now again, here's what we're gonna do. We're, guys, we're taking small budgets to make them squeeze as far as we possibly can, okay? We can't just have the spray and pray when it comes to placement, okay? We need to identify the placements that are giving us that best return, all right? That's giving us that highest engagement and when it's good, it's good. You go all in, right? All right that's what we want to do here. We want to go all in on those placements or those devices that are bringing us that, that engagement. All right? Frequency needs to step up. Okay? We want to optimize for about six to eight times. That means I'm going to present this ad to you about six to eight times over a 30 to 60 day window. Okay? Again, if you don't engage with it, that's cool. We're done. I, I continue to move on. I'm not going to take you down to my next level bucket. Okay? Average cost per click here can range anywhere between 60, to 60 cents to $1.20. It does cost a little bit more. Why? Because we're going over a 60 day window and we've increased our frequency again, okay? Remarketing. Your audience, a lot of opportunity here, right? And it all has to do with engagement, okay? This is where now, since we've, dri we've driven traffic now to your VDP pages, we wanna include that into our remarketing. But we also want to include all interest level engagement. So you can start to see, we start with a big fishnet, start filtering through all the people that actually consumed the video or gave a crap about what we had to say. At the interest level, we presented anywhere between four to six pieces of creative to determine if the, what their interest level actually is. If they engage with at least half of those pieces, so about three to four pieces of creative at the interest level, then and only then will I move them on to the remarketing. And this is where we get really specific. Okay, this is where we'll present a time sensitive campaign or in this case, an actual payment. All right, and it's a call to action, you know, click here to learn more, call me now, messenger. All right, I got a couple dealerships in here that right now are crushing it on messengers. Does everybody know? At the Lexus GX460, it offers an unparalleled level of comfort with an option to electronically operate the floor and drop and the company will happily share it. Okay, we're good. <laughs> um, sorry, uh, Messenger. <laughs> We're going to pass that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're gonna pass that one. Um, uh, messenger. D did you guys know that you can actually install Messenger on your website right now for no cost? Okay. It's a really sweet tool. In fact, I got, I got one or two people in here that right now they're selling cars directly off of Messenger, and it's a completely free tool. All right. 
Facebook does know a little, under, understand a little something about audiences. All right, I love the Facebook Marketplace. If you guys aren't currently on Facebook Marketplace, you need to be on Facebook Marketplace. I love what they did on Facebook Marketplace. They said, we're not gonna let you fill out a form <laughs> because nobody actually responds back to those things. All right, it's a bad experience. So Facebook said, if you're gonna participate in Marketplace, then you need to be prepared to actually engage with the customer in real time at that moment. So Messenger is great. It's a great way to communicate. Plus, guys, the other advantage of Messenger is that it's cross-device platform, okay? I mean, I can, inst I, can start my, I can start my conversation here, and I can continue my conversation here, and then I can pick up the conversation back here, all right? There's not a live chat system out there that can do that, and this one's free. <laughs> all right, optimization of that remarketing level, okay? Um, we're going to really increase frequency at this point, okay? Really high frequency, all right? At this point, we're, we're, it's the ask. Now I'm actually asking for something. You gotta understand, most strategies out there just go straight for the ask. Well, I'm not going straight for the ask, okay? I've created awareness, I determine interest, now I'm coming in for the ask, all right? And when I ask, I ask 15 to 20 times over a 30-day window. <laughs> I ask a lot, <laughs> all right? And it's for the simple reason, guys, that the, at this point, they've engaged with so many pieces of your creative, it is completely fair to do so at this point. It really is, okay? They didn't just go to your website one time, didn't engage with one piece of creative. At this point, they've gone to your website multiple times. They've engaged with multiple pieces of creative, okay? It is completely, utterly fair right now to, for the ask. Ask them to fill out that form. Ask them to engage with you on Messenger. Ask them to do call. By the way, you actually can do call, call ads, call, to, call, now, at, call now ads, where you can present them the message and literally it connects straight to you guys' as well. All right. Average cost of a, per, of a lead down here is about 10 to 20 bucks. Not bad for someone who's really re that's responding to an action, right? They are, it is a call to action, it is a payment, it is an offer. I'm good on time. Okay, I may have gone over that a little fast. I have a tendency of doing so. Any questions real quick about that air strategy? Shoot. You can, create an, you can create a bucket like that. Yeah, absolutely. You can go to the audiences and develop out an audience that have engaged with you on Messenger. And the cool thing is all those chats are also saved as well, of course, on your Messenger. Yep. Any other questions, guys? I did that good, good job. All right, <laughs> that's very cool. Okay, well good, it's uh, perfect time. So that worked out really, really well. Guys, what we're gonna do now is uh, we're gonna break. We gotta leave this room. All right, for about, I think about 30 or 40 minutes. Okay, they're gonna reset the entire room. If they can do it a little faster, I'm gonna come grab you guys. Uh, but if you want, feel free to grab a drink and you guys, we can hang completely out here. Can we take drinks into the lobby? Yes, yes. Okay, all right, cool. Uh, as you guys walked in, there's a huge monster lobby out there. Oh, outside for cigarettes. No, no, no drinks outside, okay. <laughs> no drinks outside. All right, guys, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it, all right. The mugs are yours. Yeah, you leave them here. Um, no, grab your mug. If you're going to keep your mug, grab your mug because the whole, all the tables will be moved. Thanks. Appreciate it, Steve. Thanks, guys.